Well, hello, and welcome to Crucial Conversations. I'm Peter. And I'm Kevin. And Kevin, it's been a while since we recorded an episode, but we're still here, right? Still here. We're still separated by a river. That hasn't changed. Still locked in my house. (laughs) I'm still recording from my basement. That didn't change. It hasn't changed. So we haven't had an episode since this whole COVID thing started. I guess the last episode we did with Pastor Ill was right as it was kind of getting going. And now, since then, we've been locked in our homes for a month. Yeah. Which, frankly, I've been okay with. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I'm not an extrovert, at least not overwhelmingly so. Yeah, don't tell anyone, but... This is going okay so far. I, <laughs> this, I, I kind of kind of knew that. I mean, I definitely knew that about you. I figured, yeah, yeah Kevin locked in his home with his family for a month. He'll be okay. No he'll, problem. He'll enjoy that. Yeah, he gets, his, gets family time. And I, I love my family, so I wasn't like worried about it. But now that I've been here, it's like, okay, I just, I've always wondered, am I really extroverted and am I an introvert? Where do I actually fall on that scale? And it's like, well... I got extrovert tendencies, but based on this, I'm pretty much an introvert because Okay, so so I'm this whole fine. discussion of what am I and what kind of personality do I have, this is actually kind of interesting as we begin this discussion because Yeah. We're actually gonna talk about these kinds of things as COVID nineteen and whatever you guys want to call what we're going through <laughs> as a world, right? The coronavirus <laughs> pandemic, whatever you want to call it. It's exposing things. We should start calling it the great pandemic until the next one comes along. And then this will become pandemic one and the next will be right. pandemic two. This is the right? pandemic to end all pandemics. Yes. There we go. That'll okay. Work. <laughs> so we're, we're going to kind of talk through some of the things you and I have observed philosophically. Is that, is that a good way to say it, Kevin, of what we're going to talk about today? I think I think we're going to talk about yeah philosophically or some of the the philosophies and isms that you and I have been discussing and watching and and kind of working through either between us or even on the podcast sometimes mm-hmm. and what has this whole event and the way that our world has handled it what has it exposed to us and we're we're nobodies but from <laughs> from our weird points of view we what have has microphones this and a podcast. Therefore, we're experts, right? We are experts, yes. Listen Woo! to us. Um, <laughs> but, but really, just a casual conversation that everyone's willing to welcome to join in. I th- if they have questions, they can. Send them to questions at crucialproductions.org or go to our website, crucialproductions.org. There's a ask a question thing up the top there. And we're on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I check all those. You can send us questions there as well. Uh, especially because some of the stuff we are going to talk about, we're going to use big words like modernism and postmodernism, and we already used philosophy, so right. that big cat's words. out of the bag. <laughs> and and if anybody wants to drive over and ask us questions in person, they're welcome to do so, but they ha- but they have to stay, you know, like in the street or something. While yeah, like on six porches feet away. Or something. Or... We would like that. I don't understand how that works. Yeah. But... <laughs> but yeah, so so as we go along, we're going to kind of just let you eavesdrop into a discussion that Peter and I are having, and uh, you're welcome to join in. Please ask us questions, um, send us questions, and, and the next time we discuss, then we might discuss your questions, um, uh, answer them how, or something. And given how these conversations go between us and then the topic of COVID and philosophy, odds are this is going to generate more questions from listeners, and so we welcome you to send those to us <laughs> or, or the last time the last, our three listeners join us. We'll see. And that's the end of our that's podcast. Right. Of our this part. could be the last episode, which for all anybody knew the last episode was with pastor ill. Cause we yeah. didn't podcast for a month and nobody asked where we were. No one, <laughs> no one freaked out or anything. I, I nobody tweeted <laughs> us and said, Hey, are you going to record another podcast anytime soon? So I think we've already, that cat's out of the bag too. The, yeah, that horse has left the stable. Uh, Whatever metaphor we have for demise, it fits for us right now. <laughs> that so anyway, getting getting on to our discussion. Unfortunately, yeah. this is also part of our discussions. <laughs> um, this is how they go in real life. It's it's interesting. We live in a in a very odd time. Obviously, unique would actually be the correct word. Unique meaning one of a kind. Unique um, New York. I this said is. It. How do you catch a strange rabbit? Unique New York? Unique up on it. 
Exactly. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, and this there you go. Shark. Woo. Yes. So um, <laughs> it is a unique time in our history. And, and the interesting thing is not so much that there is a, a disease or maybe whatever, right? <laughs> that's sweeping the globe or, and again, again, that's kind of up for discussion even, but it's, yeah. it's more our reaction to it. Our reaction, meaning as a world, as a church, as a society, as uh, you know, whatever, what it, yeah. what is our reaction to this? And, and what is the fact that we must react to it actually exposing to us about our philosophies, about some idols we might've been holding on to, um, those kind of things. So that, that's kind of where we're going to talk about. Well, well so the, this whole must react, I mean, that's it's interesting to phrase it that way because this is the first time we actually have reacted in this way to something that it, it's not unique. There, there have been other diseases, other pandemics around the world throughout history, but this is the first time we've reacted in this particular way and chosen these particular courses of action as a world so that's interesting yeah and and why are we reacting this way and and why are we not reacting in a different way is mm-hmm. kind of where where our discussion i guess finds its generation is that when we see how different entities are reacting to this and, and to be to be totally frank the the uniformity of reaction by different yeah. entities, I think, is what is what makes me kind of sit up in the middle of the night and go, "Wah!" Yeah, you don't you don't have five different kinds of responses happening in five different ways. It's kind of like there's one, and then there's a few outliers here and there that are doing their own thing. But for the most part, it's just everybody's doing it in this way, and we're all agreeing that this is the way to do it. Yeah, I think that's what you just said and, and did was was kind of what freaks me out. You, you nodded your head when you said that and we all and, and it's like uh-huh. everyone just agrees that the best course of action is to hide yeah and that's I'm in it. my basement I'm yeah I'm I'm well and, hidden and the weird thing is is that if you go outside people are like no dude you're supposed to hide that's the right thing to do and you say wait I live in a world in which all of our medical technology, all of our science progress, all of the wisdom and schmarts in the entire world adds up to when the disease hits, hide in your house. I just realized why people aren't asking where we are because we're actually still doing Bible studies every week. Right. <laughs> and la- I mentioned that because we released a video last week, Kevin, of one of those Bible studies where you talked about, okay, the response from science is basically hide hide the the best answers from the best minds around the world everybody doing everything they can to fix this the best answer is still hide there's nothing that can be done stay away from it at, at if at all possible and and then what what what's even probably more problematic to me as someone who associates with the human race often is <laughs> when you're forced to when i'm forced to you such that, an introvert <laughs> is that we are actually oh, i'm not an introvert is that we're actually encouraged to see other humans as the source of death and yeah. to treat them as though that's the most important thing about them so now i'm cool looking at you through a computer screen because i know you're you know 30 miles away from me or whatever you are across a river but if <laughs> if you were in the same room as me I'm being encouraged by my world to see you as a threat because you've been exposed to other human beings who might have this disease. And now you're bringing all the exposures of your life into my room. Don't worry. We're not in the same room. We're keeping social distance. Nope. <laughs> and, but if you did, I'm encouraged not to see you as a, as a human being who needs love and affection and a brother in Christ. Instead, I'm, I'm encouraged by my world, including my church even, to see you as somebody who could have a disease that could kill me and my family. And therefore the best thing I can do is stay away from you. Which, which is ironic as Christians that rather than loving our neighbor, this has been flipped on its head where my neighbor is actually now my enemy and right. loving my neighbor means Staying away. treating him as my enemy. Right. Which is- and, and then saying, <laughs> no, this is best for them 
for me to treat them like one of us might have a deadly disease and therefore we should avoid each other. It just happens to also be convenient for me because right. it protects me from this deadly disease me. also. So we're all good, right? <laughs> yeah, so everybody's and, fine. And and we've 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 really become kind of locked into this reaction in which what would we say? The the institutions that we have entrusted with ensuring our health and our safety have thrown up their arms in utter defeat and yet we're still listening to them. Well, and, utter defeat for now. Yeah, and that's the thing. Oh, just, that's the just give part. us some time. Yeah. We'll figure out nothing. Trust us, we will fix trust, this. Trust us, we have no idea what we're doing. <laughs> and and this is kind of the problem is, and I know some people out there are already mad at me for, for saying these things. I'm not against medicine. I'm not against science. I keep reiterating some of my best friends, and I'm not, I know it sounds kind of cheesy, but some of my best friends are actually doctors. And I'm, I'm not kidding. They actually are. Some <laughs> and of my better friends are actually doctors. And sometimes. I go to them when I'm, injured or sick yeah but but i think what we're seeing is on a global scale the the false teaching that science will save humanity from anything that affects humanity in the long run is being exposed and so, this is a key component of modernism growing yeah. out of the enlightenment in which we were taught that human progress will result in greater health and security and less human conflict, greater peace, greater human rights throughout the world. All of these things that were seen as base assumptions of good within humanity, all of these quote good things were promised to be accomplished through the progress of the scientific method, through human intellect and human pursuits. Yeah. And, and this is why we, we framed this conversation initially as talking about philosophy and our observations, because at some point, I don't know, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, you and I were chatting, and I don't know which of us said it first. I know I actually, I did say it at some point, but I said, Kevin, this is, we're basically just seeing modernism on, di on display. Mm -hmm. Modernism has the global stage right now, which is ironic because postmodernism supposedly killed it and yet yep. here it is maybe maybe this is its last hurrah uh it'll never totally die we can talk about that because you have to be totally non-rational okay now i'm going down a rabbit trail or yeah. not human yeah <laughs> so but 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 the point is I, I we look at this and my observation was well this is modernism this yep. is science telling us trust us and everybody saying yes okay. we do we trust you you will fix this you will tell us the answer we will wait in our homes until that day comes when you have the answer for us, science, because we believe you can do it. And when we had that conversation, my response to you was, I actually read online that day before we had talked a post about somebody saying, you know, what we should do is just wait. And the point of the article was because science and progress will save humanity that was yeah. actually their closing line and it was in bold print yeah and i wish i would have saved it so i could quote you the source but that was actually the end of the article was seriously just wait because our hope is in science and human progress and that will win out mm -hmm. well and, and i'm seeing this on on facebook on twitter social media people posting saying the same thing where we, we can do this, let's come together as humans, and we'll get through this together because eventually there will be a vaccine that'll solve this problem. Eventually, herd immunity will work, or wh whatever the scientific answer is, everybody is saying, and, and when I say everybody, I, I actually mean everybody. I mean, that maybe that's why this observation, this Not conversation, me. well, except... I was going to say, except I haven't seen you, Kevin, but right. now I'm looking at you I'm on sorry. a video screen. So technically I'm seeing you. I don't, I don't know. Right. But, but, the, but yeah, but everyone's kind of in this together. Yeah. The public conversation that is happening is we're all in this together. Science is going to solve it. It's going to fix it. Um, and then anybody who disagrees with that, if people are like, Hey, wait a minute, what are we doing? Is this actually the right response? Those people are bad. I mean, you very quickly get that feeling online where those people get jumped on or they're very careful where they say it and how they say it because they're going against what the general public is saying. 
Um, and they're, you know, half the time they're instantly labeled as crazy mm-hmm. or, you know, you're, you're going to kill people. Right. right. Maybe that's the, that's the disturbing part. Right. And that's I've the thing is. Christians is, telling other Christians, if you continue to have church in any form, or if you continue to go out and do things and live your life, you are murdering people. As a matter of fact, some Christians are now <laughs> saying, oh, did you see that crazy pastor at church over there? Well, you know, people from his congregation probably get sick and they deserve it because they shouldn't have had church. And, and these we're are almost Christians rejoicing in yeah. other Christians getting sick or something and saying, see, they deserve it. Now, let's be clear. This podcast is not to say that we know better than everybody else and we've got it figured out. We're not here. We're not conspiracy theorists saying there is no COVID-19 yeah. and there's this kind of ruse. Or, we're not. That's not what we're getting at. I am still in my basement. Right. But and I, I am still if it's just because I like it. <laughs> and, well, yeah. And, and and I'll be totally upfront. My family and I are doing our best to obey the government rules about social distancing and not gathering mm-hmm. more than 10 people. Um, I'm teaching Bible class online instead of going to my church to teach there. So right. we are doing our best to We obey. are not attempting to foment a rebellion of any no, kind. We are not. And we're not we... encouraging anybody to yeah. to break rules. That's yeah, not we what would we're not, we at. would not do that. We're simply wanting to provide um, some opportunity for thought, for reflection, and, and to be totally blunt, for hope. Yeah. Um, and, and I think this is an important thing as, as we talk about philosophy. And a lot of people ask me why I care about philosophy because I'm, I'm a theologian, not a philosopher. <laughs> and, and the reason is because I find in philosophy a lot of opportunity for discussion because I think philosophy, even secular philosophers, maybe sometimes especially secular philosophy, helps us understand how humans have observed how humans interact or encounter this world. I don't know if that made sense or not, but I think philosophy helps us understand how humans have observed other humans as they interact and encounter this world. Well, maybe it's uh, philosophy is, is a way into entering the human conversation with other humans in a way that doesn't require them to also be Christians like us so that we can communicate effectively yeah um it's so, kind of like anthropology my background is anthropology first in, in college and you know the two big questions are why do people do what they do and why do different people do things differently and having that convert you, you can have that conversation with anybody right it doesn't require them to be an insider christian to be able to have a meaningful conversation so philosophy is kind of a way to do that as well right yeah exactly and so when we encounter an event like this, that is, and again, whatever whatever narrative you are choosing to embrace at this point regarding COVID-19, and there are different narratives. I hope you guys understand that. Yeah. There, are, there are lots of different <laughs> narratives right now. You, and you the mainstream gotta, media is one. Yeah, and you got to kind of pick your narrative. But, and and we're, again, we're not here to tell you which narrative is right. Yeah. Um, or which narratives are right. We're not. That's not our point. But <laughs> but no matter which one you're choosing to follow or believe or in, or embrace, this is affecting your life. Yeah. I mean, even if you are on one side of the coin and everybody else you live with is on a different one, that's affecting your life and and our daily interactions. The fact that we can't go to restaurants and our churches are not normal, even if they're still doing something that's still not normal, still not right. the way it was. Yep. So it is affecting yeah. us. And and the point is. Okay, so it's affecting us. It has exposed, I think everybody would agree, it has exposed at least the fallacy of the, fallacy of the infallibility of science and medicine and progress. To be totally blunt, this has shown us that human progress is not going to save us. It simply well, isn't. Well, okay, I'm going to push back on that because everybody who has uh, two things. This is a question of trust which we have talked about a lot on our podcast. Mm -hmm. So part of this conversation is where are we placing our trust? And Mm -hmm. so for people who have placed their trust in science uh, to one degree or another, they're going to push back and say, Kevin, you can't say that because it simply hasn't done it yet. Right. So that's not an accurate statement. It, It will. It just hasn't yet. So you can't say right now, Kevin, that science has failed and this has shown its flaw because, well, it just hasn't yet. Right. And and that's that's the great 
you know, that's that's the great emperor has no clothes move of science is that we'll just keep moving the target until we can finally meet it and say, see, we hit it. That doesn't make any uh, sense. That's not actually the way it works. And <laughs> and the yeah, I'm not saying science won't eventually help us get over this issue. It it might. It Again, it might not. I hope you guys are, are aware of that. Um, I, I wonder but, if it's more like the flu vaccine where there's a different one every year. Right. So and that's, and, we're going to have to deal of, with this in one way or another. A lot of yeah. the project, again, we're not here to tell you which narrative is true, but, but there that's are narratives said, that, <laughs> that show different outcomes of this, but, but no matter how this ends up ha- turning out, the reality is something hit our world in which 7 billion people agreed. The best reaction is to hide and hope. Hmm. That's it. It okay. wasn't science has solved it. We just got to get access to the science. No, listen to the scientists. They're saying we have no idea how to stop this. They're saying we are months, if not years away from a vaccine. Yeah. And we we're not theories. sure we'll ever find a vaccine. SARS still doesn't have a vaccine. So from what I've read. So yeah. there are there are lots of things where science itself is. I'm not making stuff up. This is this, Science itself is saying we don't know how to stop this right now. And we don't know if we ever will know how to stop this. So it, at the very least, this is exposing to us that the hope in science to end human suffering is a false hope. Science might help us get over whatever specific things we end up suffering from, yes. And mm-hmm. like I said, if I break my arm, I would quickly go to a doctor to help him, to ask him or her <laughs> to, to fix it for me, right? To set it. Can you and put to this put in, in a cast, cast right. please? Can you please yeah. fix this? I would not say, well, you know, I'm righteous, so I'm going to deal with a broken arm a different way. No, I'm not saying that at all. But the point is, I don't then say to that doctor, you're my, sa- you're my savior, you're my salvation, you are my hope for a long life, you're my hope for long-term hmm. health. No, okay, I that, don't. Okay, that's an important distinction, because I think we don't, let me phrase it this way. I don't think of myself as doing that when I go to a doctor. Right. But am, am I doing it anyways? Like right. how am I missing when I'm actually doing that? So so the question for us is, is where are we putting our hope? And then when, when this is what I always say is, it's easy to say, I put my hope somewhere when life is going just fine. Right? Mm-hmm. It's easy mm-hmm. to be, the Sunday school kids skipping out of Sunday school saying, Jesus loves me, carries me on his shoulders like a little lamb. Isn't this wonderful? I'm in, I'm in Jesus loving arms. It's easy to say that when everything is going fine. Hmm. But when life falls apart and God appears to be totally absent, it's hard to believe that Jesus is carrying you like a little lamb. Okay. The, the footprints in the sand, that, that poem is great when you're sure God has been carrying you, but when you're actually looking around for footprints, that are ain't any, it's hard to say it. It's hard to believe it. it. And this is the problem is that we have been told our entire lives that the thing you can always count on is progress and science and human intellect. And now we're in a situation when science and progress and human intellect are looking us in the face and saying, we got nothing. Just wait for us to catch up to this one and we might figure it out. And my, my prayer for anybody listening to this is that this is the opportunity for you to go back to the word of God and find hope in promises that cannot be broken because they've already been kept. And that's not, those aren't empty words to say, oh, just don't pay attention to what's going on and just pretend it's not as bad as it looks. No, it is as bad as it looks. People are dying. Thousands of people are dying. Tens of thousands of people are dying. Possibly hundreds of thousands of people will die from this. Okay. That's a reality. Possibly millions of people will die from this. That's a reality. Now, the question is, do you believe in a God that can deal with hundreds of thousands of human deaths? And still be God. Well, if he's God, he doesn't still, he just <laughs> is. Yeah, but mentally that's how we think of it. it. And and that's the issue is look back at the Old Testament. God wiped out over 100,000 Assyrians in one night. And we all said, oh, that's great. Look how he protects his people. God told the Israelites to wipe out everyone in the promised land. And we said, oh, well, that's because he's, he's pushing 
for you know, purity of his people in the promised land. And we say, oh, we can explain that away. This is what God is doing. And now what's happening is that tens of thousands of people, if not hundreds of thousands of people are dying and we're saying, oh, well, this is a scientific problem. Hmm. This is a human problem. And my question for you is, why isn't this a God problem? Why isn't it like those other examples? Yeah, why don't we look and say, God, what are you doing? Hmm. And the problem is that it's not distinguishing between Christians and non-Christians. You can't say, well, God is protecting his people, Israel, his, his beloved church. And so all Christians are immune from this. So if, if we have church, I guarantee no one will get church, get sick. We, we can't say that, right? There is, <laughs> yeah. there is a good chance that if, if we gather, you know, my, my church normally has about 200 and some people in worship on a Sunday morning. Yours is probably a little more. I think Peter, if we, if we uh, gathered with that yeah. normal gathering for Bible class and church and donuts and coffee and sacrament and all that, then we're probably going to have some be somebody could get sick from that gathering. There's no promise of immunity just because we gather on word and sacrament, right? We're well, not saying that somebody does get sick from that gathering every week. Maybe it's just a cold. Maybe it's the flu. Maybe it's not this, but the reality is we are spreading yes. stuff every time we gather every week. And, and for the, for our entire lives, that has been okay. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I happen to know personally that you brought your daughter when she was extremely young and very vulnerable to disease to a public place. With you lots even, of people. You even let me hold her. <laughs> that was actually the scary part. Yeah, that was the scary <laughs> part right there. Okay. More, so, more for the dropping, not the disease. Right, exactly. It's like, oh, Kevin might oh, get boy. nervous. <laughs> it's a baby. So, But this is the point. When we do that for a baptism, we say... This is good. This, this is, is good. necessary. These, these are parents we, putting their priorities correctly. They are saying that washing this child into Christ is more important than any cold or illness that she might get. Right? Uh, well, I, yes, but I also know parents who would wait longer because exactly. of Exactly. Who, who will wait a month or two months to baptize because of that concern. Right. And so right away we have this this conflict in our faith that we all have to admit is a reality for us between when are we supposed to take care of our physical life and when are we supposed to make sure the kingdom of God is what we're focused on. Hmm. And that's what we're trying to have the discussion about in this podcast and we're inviting you to join us with your questions is yeah. how has this situation exposed the false god of modernism and science and progress and yet we're still stuck in a world in which science and progress and medicine play a huge role even in my life right well and, and if and if the listener is asking right now well then why didn't you start with that well the reason we didn't start with right off the bat is because we're seeing the response being one more governed by philosophy and mm -hmm. and its underpinnings and its assumptions particularly modernism than we are this so it's kind of like we needed to work through this for half an hour to get to okay what's the real question and and so as we ask this question the other you know we bring up other isms and you think postmodernism is like well does postmodern have a better answer and the answer is no, no. it doesn't <laughs> and you think well what about deconstructionism does that have a better answer and the answer is no it doesn't no and you put any ism on there right <laughs> yeah pre-modernism there, <laughs> what whatever no, it is, it there's doesn't. still human philosophical right. systems. And, and this is, I think, where where Peter and I, part of the reason crucial projections exists, is is the the constant encouragement to move our focus away from us, and learn to see all of life, including this, as as being lived out under the cross of Christ. Hmm. That the correct response to this situation in our life is to repent it's to yeah. fall on our face before a holy god and say i am being reminded today i am i am being it, it's in my face i can't avoid the reality that i have zero control over life and death i i have nothing i can't see this coming i you know what here's the reality i could hide all i want i could still get it yeah 
I personally know people, two people that I know personally right here who have had or have COVID-19 currently, okay? There, there's no guarantee that I won't get it or haven't gotten it or whatever. And now good news, they've both recovered. But, <laughs> but I've known two people, which means at some point, who knows, right? And yeah. we can't control it. We can't see it. We can't stop it. We can't control it. And right now we can't fix it. So God is calling us to repentance through this. He is saying, get on your face. And I mean face as low as you can get before God, admit who he is and who you are. I am not God. I have no control over this, but God is God and not just still God is simply God. This is not shocking to him. This is not outside of his control. This didn't catch him off guard. He's not unsure of the future. He is not abandoning those whom he loves. He has not changed his promises. He has not changed his covenant. He has not changed his means of grace. He is not saying, well, I, I don't, I, uh, I don't know. I don't know. How to I wasn't ready for now. this. What? <laughs> You're secluded in your houses. What? See, I didn't see this coming. That. This is, this is the point is no human philosophy, no human pursuit, no human wisdom, no economic strategy. Nothing is going to save you. Hmm. Nothing except the one who is the savior of the world. His name is Jesus. So the question for us is how do we live as repentant sinners in this present reality? I encourage you all. I encourage everyone who's listening to, to spend time in the scriptures and to lead your families and your friends in repentance to pray prayers of repentance lord god i confess that i have made myself to be a god that i have trusted my own wisdom my own smarts my own abilities i've trusted in other human agencies and institutions i've trusted in science and medicine to make me feel secure i've trusted in my finances and my investments mm -hmm. and my in insurance to make me feel secure about my future and today you are reminding me to trust in you alone mm -hmm. forgive me yeah. for all my misplaced trust and by your spirit turn me that's what repentance means turn me to trust in christ alone as the one who provides Teach me to trust that all that I have is given by the Heavenly Father and that He takes care of all the things that I need. Teach me to live my life not scared of death, but living in the hope of the resurrection. And let me love my neighbor with that same hope. So one, one of the places I've, I've thought about in Scripture that, that seems to speak to this is, is Jesus, uh, the Olivet Discourse in Matthew mm -hmm. 24 and 25, specifically when people are asking, well, what are the signs of the times? How will we know these things, these things are coming? And Jesus is talking about there'll be war and rumors of wars and famines and disease and pestilence. And so we're looking around, it's like, oh, we got, we got wars, we got rumors of wars, there's famines, and okay, now we got the pestilence, we got the disease. And his, his response isn't just... I mean, he says, and, and then the end will come, mm -hmm. but he also says, more importantly, repent mm -hmm. because the end is near. It, it's, yep, you're going to see all these things around you. He doesn't say, okay, great. Uh, five minutes after that, here's the end. No, that's not the important point he's trying to make. He says, you'll see all these things around you. Repent. So this, this is, Jesus himself says this, where else, you know, as you encourage us to spend time in scripture, Kevin, where else would you encourage us to look and be reading right now? I really encourage people to read, and, and I know this is a little dangerous to suggest, but but just trust me in this. <laughs> read Isaiah 40 through 55. Hmm. Read Isaiah, the, the, the prophet Isaiah, verses or chapters 40 through 55. You can read 40 to 66 if you want, but 40 to 55 is really the kind of the, the focus because this is God's word to his people who are in exile and they're facing death. They're facing um, fault, the temptation to worship false gods, Isaiah 40 to 55, what you'll find in there is four servant songs, right? 
in Isaiah 42, 49, 50, and then 52 to 53 is the fourth servant song. And, and the servant is this, the servant of Yahweh, literally the one who serves Yahweh, and the way he serves Yahweh is by rescuing his people. And, mm-hmm. and that's obviously fulfilled in Christ. You'll see a lot of the things in the life of Christ that fulfills these these promises or these songs to the servants. So Isaiah 42, 49, 50, and then 52 to 53 are these servant songs. Um, and that, that kind of pulls together this section of Isaiah 40 through 55, which again is is the time of God's promise to his people as they're in exile. Listen to how it starts. You guys know Isaiah 40. You guys know it by heart. Comfort, comfort my people. Oh, I can sing that one. Yeah, you can sing it, right? But, but I'm not going to. But but you can. <laughs> That's how well we know it. And then you also yeah. know Isaiah 55 because it, it, it ends by saying this. Come to me, everyone who's hungry. And then, and then later in Isaiah 55, it says... My word will not return to me void, but will accomplish that for which I sent it forth. It also says in Isaiah 55, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. See, all of these verses, that's Isaiah 40, 55 right there. That's the beginning and end. And in the middle, you have these servant songs where what's the answer when you're in exile? It's not to turn to false gods. It's not to turn and invent new ways of hope. It's to return to the Lord your God. Joel chapter two, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious mm-hmm. And he has steadfast love, right? Return to the Lord your God. Why? Not because he's going to zap you. Not because he's going to say, ha ha, I caught you in your idolatry. No, but because with the Lord is steadfast love. With the Lord is plenteous redemption. Psalm 130, okay? When you read these passages about exile, what you're reading about is God's rescue from exile. Confess, Hmm. repent, and trust because the God who sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you is the God who loves you. He has not left you for one second in all of this. He has, the future is in his hand. We don't know how this will end, but we he does, and he promised to be with us through every second of this. And here's the thing, I guarantee you this, that everyone who is in Christ will be raised up in the last day. Mm-hmm. Death has been defeated. Amen. That is the crucial conversation, focusing us on Christ and what he's done as the answer to this, not science or government or whatever else we are so tempted to place our trust in today, but Christ and what is the answer that he's given. So um, thanks for joining us today, everyone. This is Crucial Conversations. I'm Peter. And I'm Kevin. And we'll see you guys next time. See ya.